Bibles, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture together, 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power. Somebody say power. power. Say love. love. And say self-discipline. self-discipline. Let's pray. Father, today I ask that you would go way beyond what I can do as a teacher. I ask you to speak to each and every one of us that we would get the most out of what you have for us to hear today. That when we leave, we would be different in the way that we think, in the way that we approach life, in the way that we view your scripture and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we've been on this several weeks, and I love this translation in the NLT. Many translations say that God has given us a sound mind, power, love, and a sound mind. But I like the way the New Living Translation puts it as self-discipline. Because the truth of the matter is you will not have a sound mind if you don't discipline yourself to think on the things of God. Uh, sound mind, you can't just say, okay, I want a sound mind, and that's it. It doesn't work. So many times we think, well, I'll just go and the pastor will pray for me and I'll have a sound mind. It can start there because it's a decision. I believe every decision affects our decisions from there forward. But the the thing is, if someone was to pray for you, I could pray for Bob, my friend here, missionary home to pick up his his oldest son and take him back home to the rest of the family and Jessica and everybody. But I could pray over, say hi, stand up, Bob, say hi. Hi, Hey, Bob. From Mexico, up here to cool off a little bit. It's probably pretty hot down there, but it's been nice here too. But I could pray and I could say, okay, Bob, you're going to have a sound mind the rest of your life. And he could walk out of here and act like a fool. And I know he wouldn't do that, but he'd act like a fool and he would not have a sound mind. I mean, know what I'm talking about. So it's not a magical prayer, but we need to have self-discipline to choose to think on the things of God if we're going to live in power and love and a sound mind. Uh, Fear is something that we're all going to face in life. The enemy tries to get in. Fear of failure, fear of people, whatever it is. Fear is just false evidence appearing real. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to give you a different path for your life. It says he has not given us a spirit of fear. I really believe with all of my heart that the spirit of fear is a prophetic utterance from the enemy. See, God's promises to you and I in Christ are yes and amen. He gives us a future. He gives us a hope. But what the enemy does is he says, no one will ever like you again. Your life will never work out. You are going to go broke. You are going to die of a sickness. And if we listen to the voice of the enemy, a prophetic voice for a dismal future, then those are the things we're going to think on and our life will be miserable. In fact, we'll find out today if we think on those negative thoughts, we will probably inherit the very thing that we fear the most. See, when a God-given opportunity comes along, it's God's gift to us. Well, what we do with that opportunity is our gift back to God. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You've got to settle in your mind that if I make a decision to serve God, to live for God, I'm not talking about perfection, but make a decision to live by faith and make a decision to realize that God has nothing but good for me and that he's a rewarder when I live according to his principles, then I'm telling you right now that you are going to have a successful life in God. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about the topic of worry. We need to refuse to worry. In fact, say this with me. Say, I I refuse refuse to worry. There's a good start. We just need to make a decision, self-discipline, to have a sound mind. I am not going to worry, Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Have you ever been so consumed with the things of life that you can't stop thinking about them? How are the bills going to get paid? How am I ever going to have a successful future? Will I ever meet that special someone? Will so-and-so ever forgive me? Can I ever forgive myself? Will I ever buy the house of my dreams? Will I ever have that job that I long for? All of these things, and we'll worry, and we'll worry, and we'll worry, and we'll worry. In fact, I think most people believe worry is just something natural and normal, and that it's uncontrollable, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's completely controllable, it's not normal, it's not natural, and you're called to live supernatural anyway. And so we need to think on the things of God and not live in worry and doubt. We need to really realize that worry is just another face of fear. Fear does not change our circumstance. In fact, fear and worry perpetuate the bad situation that you're in, all right? 
Galatians 5 and 6, I don't have time to turn there this morning, but if you take time to read it, you'll see that it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and it talks about the works of the flesh. And then in chapter 6, Paul writes this. He says, God is not mad, mocked. Whatever a man sows, that therefore shall he reap. And so the, the thing is, am I sowing seeds of fear, doubt, and worry? If I am, I'm going to reap those seeds that I'm sowing. Am I allowing the enemy to plant those seeds of doubt? And then am I working that soil around those seeds? Or am I picking those out and planting the seed of the word of God? Because if we live according to the spirit, the Bible says we will reap the things of the spirit. And so it's a decision. Say decision. If you're going to have a sound mind, you've got to make a choice. Fear is kind of like a nagging pain. Anybody ever have a nagging pain? Everybody ever have a nagging person? (laughs) <laughs> we all lift our hand for that. But you can have a nagging pain. It just doesn't go away. It seems like you can't get relief no matter what. And that's really what happens. And, and the truth of the matter is, if we suffer from, from pain for any period of time, we kind of become numb to it. We kind of get used to it. And the same thing happens with fear, with doubt, with worry. We kind of just get used to it. It's just kind of the way it is. We're used to getting up in, in the morning and saying, my life is terrible. Today is going to be terrible. Nobody's going to like me today. By the end of the day, I'll be even worse off than I was yesterday. And we just get so used to perpetuating these negative thoughts that will never be accepted, that no one will ever like us the way that we are. And so we do is we listen to the enemy. In fact, there's a story in the Bible of a man named Job. You should read it if you haven't taken the time. And it's a story of a man who the Bible says he served God. And in fact, it says that he would go and he would make offerings for his children. It says, lest they have sinned, and curse God in their hearts. And so he would go, and out of fear, he was making an offering to say, okay, God, you got my kids covered. And so in fear, he was trying to cover his children. And even though he was a godly man, there was a lot of things he didn't understand about God. And by the end of the book, God clearly reveals himself to him and rewards him double because, you see, in the book of Job, he loses just about everything. The only thing he's left with is a nagging wife. (laughs) You read the story. And she says, you ought to just curse God and die. His livestock are taken, all of his possessions burn, his children die. It's terrible. But he stays focused on the Lord. But there's something that he says in chapter 3 that I think all of us could learn from. Chapter 3, verse 25, he says, For the thing which I greatly fear comes upon me, and that of which I'm afraid has come upon me. See, when we fear something, and that's all we think about, we are allowing the enemy to open a door for that very thing that we fear the most to come into our lives. We're inviting it in. We're giving the enemy permission to invade our lives. So you may be sitting here this morning and you say, well, how does worry get in my heart? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to answer it, all right? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you look at this, okay, let's talk about faith. We'll get to worry in just a minute. Faith comes by hearing. What it's really saying is faith comes through the hearing and the preaching of the word like the setting this morning, being taught the word of God. And so we gather around the word of God. Somebody has a word of encouragement. Someone gives some instruction. Someone does some teaching like I'm doing. And when we leave, our prayer is, is that you're more encouraged in your faith because the word of the Lord has been spoken and taught. That's where it starts. But then am I speaking the word in faith and continuing to recite it over and over again? That's how faith is built up. Well, you know, the same thing is true with worry. We can, as a matter of fact, we could read it this way. So then worry comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the enemy. And so what we do is we hear what the enemy speaks. Maybe when we were a child, somebody spoke something that wasn't kind to us or said, you'll never succeed in anything, or you can't do that. You'll never make money at that, or you're, you're, never, you're not good looking enough, or you're not wealthy. Enough. All these different things. Sometimes teachers have said things to us that are cruel. Sometimes parents have said things that are cruel. Sometimes other people say things to us that are cruel. And so it kind of stamps reject on our heart. And so the rest of our lives, we're trying to overcome that very thing that we're worried about. And that's all we think of. Think of. And so our life just becomes kind of stuck in that very thing that we're trying to escape. Joshua 1.8, it says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to to all that is written, for then you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. We talked about Joshua just a couple of weeks ago in this very series, but there's a lot in this verse right here. He says, don't let this book of the law, the word of God, depart from your mouth. So what am I saying? 
What am I speaking over my life? But then he says, you meditate on it day and night. And then it says, you may observe to do. Somebody say do. There is no do. Not. There's only do, right? You need to do it. You cannot only try. You need to do. And so we need to not only speak the word, we need to meditate on it, confess it over our situation, and then do what it says to do. So many times we miss one of these three things. We don't meditate on it. A lot of us never speak the word. But then we never act in obedience out of what the word tells us. It's like I said with baptism. Through the steps of obedience, you will inherit the promises of God. If the word says do this and then you'll get this, then how many know we need to do what it says to do to get what it says we'll get? So many times, it's awful quiet in here. But see, those are, that's how faith works. The Bible says that if I do this, I'll get this. God is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. And so we speak the word of God. We meditate on the word of God. It says, then our way will be made proper, prosperous and we'll have good success. See, when we meditate and speak the word of the Lord, we have success. When we meditate on and confess the plan of the enemy over our lives, then we're going to have failure and we're going to have heartache. And so the choice is ours. Say choices. choices. See, we can choose to have a sound mind. Are you one of those people that gets up and reads the news and you think, oh my gosh, what's going on in the world? How are we ever going to be normal? Is anybody sane? The, the answer is no, nobody's sane. If you're watching the news's perspective, there are no sane people left in the world. But how many know we can change that? Come on, somebody. We can change that by thinking on the word of God, by doing what it says to do. God is the answer. Let's talk about this word meditation a little bit. Again, self-discipline to get a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7, we opened with it. New Age religion says we need to empty our minds when we meditate. Empty our conscious thoughts. It's kind of like just everything, this, but just, just kind of go, hum, hum. And just empty yourself of all those thoughts. Well, it may work for a second, but let me guarantee you, after you have your hum session, all those things are going to get right back in your head. Because the enemy comes in and wants to plant more seeds. You need to fill your mind with the word of God. Emptying it is not good enough. Sure, you need to get rid of the junk, but you need to take the word of God and bring that into your mind and start to think the thoughts of God. That's what biblical meditation is. So many Christians don't inherit the promises because we don't take time to meditate on the word of God. Or maybe we read this somewhere or read that somewhere. Or we say, well, you know, the Bible says this. It says God loves me. Well, sure, the Bible says God loves you. Maybe you sang that song, Jesus loves me, yes, I know. Or this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How many know that's a good place to start? But if you're not meditating on the word of God that give you a future and a hope, you're just going to not have success. You are going to have failure in your life. Emptying our minds. See, meditate means to ponder, to consider, to think, to roll it over and over and over again in your mind. And you just think on it. And so you think, well, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, self-disciplined mind. So, Lord, because you don't give me fear, I'm not going to think the thoughts of fear because I know that comes from the enemy. Therefore, I know I have power and your love that will never leave me or forsake me. I discipline myself to think on those things. Therefore, my way is made prosperous. That's biblical meditation. And we meditate and you read, on it, read it in the morning and you think about it throughout the day and you meditate it and you speak it and you confess it over your life. Meditation is powerful really because what God is doing is he's allowing us to use the creative ability that he has given to us when we were made in his likeness. You think about it when God created everything that's ever been created. What does the Bible say? God what? Said. Somebody said it. God said, let there be light. See, it's the very creative nature of God that he's given us. We have the opportunity to speak life or speak death into our lives. No other, no other created being has that ability except us because we're created in God's image. So am I speaking God's truth or am I entertaining the thoughts and the words and the mind sense and the influences of the enemy? So many times we think that we can take control of our lives and our circumstances by worrying about them. I remember my, my mother used to be like this. She's a whole lot better now, but she used to be worried about it. And, and she said it in a caring way. She would say, oh, well, I'm just worried about you. Anybody ever think so? Listen, worrying about your situation doesn't help it. And, and what we're really doing is we're saying, God, you can't get this. You can't take care of it. Therefore, I'm going to worry. And what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in the position of God. 
by worrying about it, by taking our own control of it. We're saying, God, you can't get this, so I'm going to worry instead, or I'm going to go do this. I know your word says this, but I'm going to do this instead because I know better than you. Oh, we wouldn't consciously think that, but that's what we're doing when we live in a way that is contrary to the word of God. We're saying we know better than God. Can you imagine? We've been given God's word. We've been given his spirit, but when we see something that doesn't line up with the word of God in our lives, we say, well, you know, uh, I know your word says this, but I'm just going to take control of it myself because I know better. You think about how many times we do that, and, and really, we just worry, and we never get over the same old thing over and over and over again. Philippians 1, 28, I love this in the Amplified Bible. It says, and in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents for such consistency and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, a proof, and a seal for them of their impending destruction, but a clear sign for you of deliverance and salvation, and that too from God. Boy, that, that, that just says a lot. Leave that up there for a moment. So he says, don't be intimidated in anything by your opponents, but be consistent, be fearless. That's your part. Say my part. My part. Say on our part. It says it's a clear sign, a proof and a seal to what? Our enemies of their impending destruction. It's like saying, okay, devil, I've read the end of the book. I win, you lose. And so he's saying, look, when we stand, when we encourage ourselves on the word of God, when we are not intimidated, when we're consistent in our, the, the confession of our mouth, when we're consistent in what we believe, when we face opposition fearlessly, it is a clear sign and proof to our enemies that God is what? Going to deliver us and he's going to save us because God's got our back every single time. So the question this morning is, what do you think in the midst of challenges? What's the very first thing that pops into your head? Are you intimidated? Are you fearful? Do you fall into complaining because you're kind of used to doing it that way? Oh, nothing ever works out for me, doggone it. If I just had it made over there like so-and-so. You notice we always think it's better. What do they say? They say the grass is greener on the other, on the other side. Don't they say that? You, know? you notice you look, at, you look at your neighbor's lawn, and you say, man, if my lawn just looked as green as theirs, and then you get over there, and they got bald spots, and they got weeds just like you do. Why don't you work on your own weeds and worry about getting a green lawn and stop looking at somebody else's green lawn? See, that's what we do with life. We say, boy, if I just had it like them, oh, so-and-so, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Listen, that is very rarely true, if ever, that people are born with a silver spoon. And even if they are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, they still got to keep that spoon going. Come on, somebody. You got to be faithful with the things that you have. Listen, if you're not faithful with the things that you have, you'll never get the things you want to get. And God has so much more to give to us than we can possibly imagine. Ephesians 3.20, I love it. It says that God is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think or imagine according to the power of God that works in us. Do you really believe that God can do better than you think? Do you really believe that God can do greater than you think? So many times we think, man, this thing I'm facing, it's just so big. It's kind of like a Goliath in our lives. But how many know God is the God that helps us to defeat our Goliaths just like he did David? Our attitude that we face negative situations with determines the outcome. The attitude that we face a negative situation with determines the kind of outcome that we can have. Again, David's attitude, you think about King David not only with Goliath, we'll get there in a minute, but his whole life he faced negativity. Those who were closest to him turned on him, tried to kill him. You think about King Saul, the first king of, yeah, I almost said Egypt. It's actually Israel. First king of Israel was Saul. And so he embraced David after he defeated Goliath and even called him son. But then as soon as David was anointed to be the next king and Saul's kingdom was being taken away from him, the Bible says that Saul tried to pin him against the wall with a javelin. He was constantly after him. In fact, if it wasn't for Jonathan, Saul's biological son, helping to deliver David, Saul probably would have killed him. He was after him. Can you imagine? David grew up. We talked about last week how, how David was the one that was left out, the one that was always kind of the odd bird out we were talking about last week. And so he goes and he kills Goliath, and Saul embraces him as a son. Can you imagine that father that David always wanted because it looks like Jesse kind of just forgot about David. He embraced all the other sons but forgot about David, and now Saul is embracing him as a very son, 
And then he turns on him and tries to kill him. Can you imagine the opposition that David faced? If that wasn't bad enough, his own family, his son Absalom tries to take a kingdom from him and tries to kill him. I mean, no, that's not good when your relatives want to kill you. <laughs> All right, come on. Some of you are thinking, I'd like to kill my relatives right now. Okay, don't be thinking that. You're in church. You can't think that way. But you think about his strength, his courage, his tenacity. You read about it. He wrote so many of the Psalms. And so many of those Psalms were written when he was facing opposition like we just talked about. But he meditated on the word of God. And he didn't let worry overtake him. Oh, he confessed the worry. That's what I love about Psalms. He'll say, well, I'm fearing, uh, feeling fearful. I'm feeling this. I'm feeling that. I'm down and out. He even talks to himself. I mean, no, sometimes it's good to talk to yourself if you say the right things. Psalm 42, 43, and 44, he continually says this, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you cast down? Think about God. Remember God. And so he would do and say, why am I feeling depressed? I'm going to think about the things of God. How many know we can all feel depressed once in a while? We can all have negative thoughts once in a while. But what do I do with those negative thoughts? Am I meditating on them or am I combating those with the word of God? And that's what you see David do time and time and time again. It's our example. And now he gives his psalms as an arsenal for us to use against the enemy. We're so familiar with David and Goliath and I love David's attitude when he comes. His, his brothers are part of the army, and they don't make very good soldiers because they're all just standing around doing nothing. Goliath comes out day and night, and he taunts them, and nobody has the courage to go and face Goliath. And so Jesse tells David, his youngest son, he says, well, why don't you go and check on your brothers? The battle is, is fierce. Go see how they're doing. It says that he gives them some cheese and bread. And so David goes and brings Domino's to his brothers, goes to Domino's Pizza, Pizza Hut, whatever your favorite one is. And he brings pizza down there and says, here's some pizza. How's the battle going? And he makes this statement. I love this. And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For this is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. I love his attitude. David says, man, you all ain't doing nothing. He stands up. What will be done for the man that, that stands up against this one who's defying the armies of Israel? What will be done for him? That's what faith is. We're believing that God is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If I fight this enemy, if I face this enemy in faith, if I stand and say, you know, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed, God rewards us. That God is able to give us more abundantly than we could possibly imagine that he meets our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus he faced fear, declared his victory, and inherited the promises of God. And as he's standing against that Goliath, as he's standing against the enemy, and this may be where you're at today, you're facing your Goliath, you're facing your enemy, something you've never faced before. Verse 44, he says, The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. See, that's what the enemy wants you to believe, that your life is over, that you are heading for destruction. No matter what, what you're facing, that's, that's ultimately what the enemy is trying to say. Your life is going to end miserably. He does the same thing to each and every one of us. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I love his attitude. He says, you come at me with your weapons of war, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Listen, you've got to be fully convinced that the name of the Lord, that the word of the Lord is stronger than whatever it is that you're facing. Whatever the enemy is trying to throw at you right now in your life, you've got to believe that God's word is stronger. That's what faith is, taking God at his word and standing. Ephesians chapter 6, it says, do all you can to stand and then stand therefore. We need to just stand. Because the truth is, God has your back. See, David didn't back down. He didn't give in to fear. He stuck with it. And not only did he defeat, defeat Goliath that day, but he went on and he defeated warrior after warrior after warrior. In fact, he raised up men around him that defeated other giants. And that's what happens when you live this way, when you have audacious faith and when you, faith, and when you face your Goliath and you continue to live, other people see your example and other people will be raised up to walk in faith just like you do. How much time do I have? Let's read this, Matthew 6. We read part of this already. Let me read 25 through 32. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, 
what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. We've been talking about this concept for weeks now in this series. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, say all these things, After all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Do you see, God wants us to have all the things that we desire for life. He has no problem with that. But he says, if that's all we're looking after, we are going to have worry in our lives, and we're not going to inherit what he says. He says, seek the kingdom of heaven first. So you think about the economy of this world is always changing. I don't know what your situation is. Maybe it's something monetary. Maybe it's a, a new job that you need to get. Things are always changing in the economy. Maybe you're facing some kind of disease or sickness, and you're thinking, man, there, I just don't see a way out of this. God has got your back. He says, don't worry. I've got you covered. I've paid the price. In the Amplified Bible, it says, stop being perpetually uneasy anxious and worried about your life. Perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life. Do you lay down and go to sleep at night and all you can do is start to think about all these things that could possibly not turn out well, things that could be your impending destruction, the ways that the enemy wants to come into your life. You just lay down and you can't get any peace. You can't get any rest. Let me tell you, God will give you peace and rest in the midst of the storm that you're facing if you'll focus on him and stop worrying. See, worry is the opposite of faith. We're taking the negative thoughts of the enemy and we're perpetuating the cycle of worry. Our words authorize the devil to get involved. See, and worry leads to doubt. James 1, 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything. From the Lord. See, when we worry, when we doubt, the Bible says that we're not going to receive anything from the Lord. Doubt, worry, fear. Next few minutes, let me just talk about this. How does doubt and worry get into our minds? Well, number one, it starts with words that we receive into our minds. Then those words start to shape our thoughts. Then our thoughts lead to how we feel. Our feelings cause us to take action. Our actions lead to habits. Our habits create our character. Our character takes us to our destination. Do you realize that the habits that you've embraced in your life are getting you exactly what you have today? So the question is, am I going to change my habits? Am I going to allow the Word of God to be the thing that I think on in the midst of the storm that I'm facing? Or am I going to fall back into worry and doubt just like I always have? Listen, you'll never see clarity and have the promises that God has for you if you allow yourself to fall into the same old habits that you've had for years and years. Somebody said this, that your success is found in your day-to-day routine. It's not just what we do once in a while. It's what you do every day. Do I get up in the morning? Do I read the Word of God? Do I have a quiet time when I can? And I realize your schedule may be different. Maybe you need to do it in the evening, but you can at least read a couple of verses before you start your day. Am I meditating on God's word? Am I choosing to not think on the words of the enemy? Am I choosing to think and meditate and confess the word of God over my life? Listen, those are choices. Somebody say choices that we have to make. If you're going to have a sound mind, you have got to discipline your thought life. And the word of God will help you to discipline your thought life so that you can have good habits that create good character that take you to the destination that God has for you. I love that testimony. Sid, are you in here? Sydney, are you still in here? I'm probably in the back there. No? Sydney was singing. She, she shared that word right before we started, how she, she'll get a word here at church, and then she'll practically get out in the parking lot, and she forgets it all. How many, how many can identify with that? Isn't that I mean, that's how, that's how it is so many times. But see, we need to continue to plug away. And so many times what we'll say is, oh, boy, I guess it's never going to change. I'm always going to be this way. It's just kind of the way I am. Stop thinking that way. 
Stop entertaining the thoughts of the enemy. You say, nope, I'm not thinking that way anymore. That's the old me. The Bible says that in Christ Jesus, old things pass away. All things, somebody say all things, become new. Don't let those old habits perpetuate. Don't allow yourself to fall back into the same old pattern that you've always lived in. The truth is to overcome doubt, the things of the spirit have got to be more real to us than even those things that we see with our eyes. Psalm 14, 1, it says this, the fool is set in his heart, there is no God. Listen, when we worry, when we doubt, when we don't embrace the word of God as truth, we are thinking like a fool. How many want to think like a fool? Anybody want to be a fool? See, we think like fools. When we think there's no God, see, when we, the truth is, when we're worrying, when we're doubting, we are not taking God at his word, so we're saying, God, you can't handle this. And the Bible says when we say there's no God, that we're a fool. So we need to believe that God is and that he's what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm going to have the worship team come on back up here for just a moment. I'd like to lead us in another song for a minute. After we sing this song, we'll have the altars open for prayer. If you need prayer, I recommend you get it. We have communion prepared here that you can come up and, and serve. But I'd like to lead us in this song together after we take a look at this story together. So many of us are familiar with this story, but I want to read it. Matthew 14, 22 through 31. It says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him on the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. I want to stop there for a moment. Jesus is just so cool. He says, okay, you guys go. I'm going to go up there and pray. See, he already knew what he was going to do. And so he's praying. The storm comes, and at the perfect time, as the storm is raging, he says, I think I'm going for a walk. I mean, he just, he just chooses the worst time ever. How many know you usually don't go for a walk on the water in the midst of a storm? I know that's not normal. That is not normal. But Jesus does things that are super normal and supernatural. He's defying the natural laws that are in place on this planet. It says, when his disciples saw him on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Ah! That's the disciples crying out for fear. Ah! But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. <laughs> Every time I read it, I have to say this. I just, I just, I get a little humor out of this. They all think it's a ghost, remember? Ah! They think it's a ghost, and Peter says, is it a ghost, or is that, is that you, Jesus? Because if it's Jesus, how many know ghosts lie? Of course, a ghost is going to say, well, come on out here. I'm Jesus. That ghost wants you to drown. So it's not much of a plan on Peter's part. Anyway, let's finish the story. So he said, come, and Peter, he had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. To me, this is probably the most miraculous thing in the Bible really it is and there's so many great stories so many great healings so many places where God meets the need of people who stand in faith but nobody that I'm aware of has it ever been recorded has ever walked on the water other than Jesus here and Peter Peter walks out on the water Peter is walking I mean think about walking on the water there's so many things gone first of all has anyone ever seen anyone walk on the water anybody no probably not and then you're thinking, okay, walking on the water is not normal. And if I try to walk on the, nor on the water, I'm going to sink and what? Drown. That was an interesting sound. That was very unnatural. But... Was it you on that keyboard doing No, please don't do that. There was something Sean, something Sean was doing earlier on the keyboard that he will never do again in this church. So help, so help me God. No, I didn't. There he goes. There is superstition. Okay, we can. Well, I mean, that's not even good enough to be Stevie Wonder. That's like funky Stevie Wonder. Okay. All right, get back to our story. But never ever have we ever seen another story like this. Peter walks on the water. And he goes, and listen, let's read on. It says, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, when he saw it, the wind was boisterous, he said, Lord, save me. And immediately 
Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? Little faith, what does that mean? Faith that only lasts for a short period. Because he had faith, but then he saw what was going on. And here's what we do. We're facing a situation. Maybe you're here today and you're facing a situation that is unlike anything you've ever faced. And you've tried to make some progress, but the enemy keeps planting those seeds and keeps saying you're going to have a destruction ahead of you. And so you need to make the choice today to not look at that storm and to say, I'm going to keep walking on the water. I'm going to keep going step by step by step by step by step by step. And those thoughts start to come and you say, no, I am not going to think those things. I take authority. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says that we should take authority over every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in Christ. We need to take authority over our thoughts. Stop thinking like a fool. Stop listening to the enemy. You will have victory if you continue to be focused on Jesus Christ, your Lord. No matter what it is you're facing, maybe you need a healing today. We want to pray with you for healing. Right after this song, like I say, the altars will be open after we declare this song together. Because the Bible says that we can encourage one another in our faith. And this song is going to help us do that. But then if you need prayer, I ask you to come down and get the prayer that you need. Maybe you need a financial miracle. Maybe, maybe you need some wisdom. I may know wisdom comes from God. The Bible says wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord. We all need wisdom in life. So, so many times we talk like a fool and we live like a fool. But well, we need God's help, and so we got to turn things around this morning. So I'm going to do this. i got to plug something in real quick. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.